it's in, in very important that we understand that the old covenant depended on mankind to do their part. So God gave them the Ten Commandments. If they could fulfill each one of those commandments, then they could be in heaven one day. But the problem is mankind can't fulfill those commandments at all. The Word of God says if you break one of those commandments, you've broken them all. So mankind can even, and Jesus gave this later on, he said, you think to cheat or you think to steal, you have already broken one of the commandments. So mankind tried to keep the commandments, and some of them even thought they kept the commandments, but Jesus set them straight. There was a man that came to Jesus Christ, and Jesus heard him say to him, what can I do to go to heaven when I die? And what happened? Jesus said, well, you keep this commandment and this commandment and this commandment. And the man said, I've kept all of those commandments from my youth up. Of course he had not. Because he had thought to break one of them. And Jesus said, then go sell everything you possess and give it to the poor. And right then, that young man broke the commandment of love. He could not fulfill the commandments. Even though Jesus said, follow me. After you sold everything, follow me. He could not even do that. So many times individuals thought they had kept the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament times, but not one of them had kept any of the commandments according to Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So mankind could not go to heaven because mankind couldn't fulfill the covenant, the old covenant that said you had to do these things if you were going to go to heaven. Why did God give the old covenant if none of us could fulfill that covenant and every one of us would be lost? Because we couldn't. The Bible in the New Testament says it was a schoolmaster. It was a tutor, tutor. And it was leading us to Christ who was the one who would fulfill those commandments. So I can say through Jesus Christ and what he did for me, and when I accepted him as my Savior, I became his child, I have kept every one of those commandments through Christ, not in person, not through my own strength, not at all through my own strength, but through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. So Jesus came along and said, I give you a new commandment. What does the word commandment mean in the Greek? Agreement. I'm giving you a new agreement. What is the new agreement? You receive me as your Lord and Savior, and I'll do it for you. I'll keep the commandments for you. And that is the way we get to heaven through Jesus Christ's atoning work on Calvary. Too many individuals think they can do it now, even in this New Testament age, by their own abilities. Like they can keep the commandments if they try hard enough. How many of us have kept New Year's resolutions if we tried hard enough? No, not very long. The Word of God makes it very clear then if it wasn't for Jesus and what Jesus did on that cross, we would be destined for eternal judgment. I owe everything to Jesus, and so do you if you've received him as your Savior. 
And the word of God makes it clear, whosoever will can receive him. It's not for a certain number of people or a certain class of people. It's for anyone that will acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and receive him uh, into their life as that Lord and Savior. So God gave me a new covenant. He said, I'll do it all. I'll even fulfill what you should have done. All you have to do is acknowledge me as your God, your Savior, your high priest, your all. When I realized that years ago, and it took time to understand that principle of God's word, it freed me from trying to keep myself saved. You cannot be lost if God did it all. You can only be lost if you're doing it all. So the hymn is very clear. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Jesus. Because Jesus did it all. But there's also a question that comes into my mind in this New Testament covenant. I always wondered about this one phrase. He had to. Jesus had to do something. He is God Almighty. Why does he have to do anything? Because we can't do it. None of us can do it. We cannot come to the point where we receive Christ as our Savior without the Holy Spirit drawing us. There is no one that has received Christ that the Holy Spirit did not show their need and encourage them to do it. The Holy Spirit gave me direction. But why would Jesus have to do anything? It's because he is love. You and I cannot understand the love of God. No, it's way beyond what we can understand. God's love is without any conditions. God loves the whole world and isn't willing that any should perish. Any should end up in the place of judgment, hell, the lake of fire. God doesn't want anyone to go there. So he has offered the gift of salvation to whomever will receive it. We read of him choosing to come to earth. He chose to do that. We read of him healing the sick in the New Testament. He chose to do that. We read of his love and his grace that was manifested to everyone that came to him. He turned no one away but those that were self-righteous Pharisees, religious people that depended on themselves instead of depending on God. So why does it say he had to do it? Because we couldn't do it. He had to become a man just like us. God the Father impregnated Mary. It was not Joseph. It was God the Father. His father had to do it because man's sin was passed on by man generation after generation. So it's through the Father that happened. I was born a sinner. I was a little baby, hopefully very cute, but normally not often. But I was a sinner. I look at uh, dear mothers. They've just had their firstborn. They're so excited about their firstborn. They love them. And I think, what a sinner. <laughs> you think I'm going to tell the mother that at that point? But we're born sinners. We're conceived in sin. So we need somebody to rescue us from the sin that we became at the point of birth. God so loved the world that he gave his only unique son, one translation puts it, King James puts it, begotten son, that whosoever, that meant anyone, believes on him as Lord and Savior, should not end up in hell, but have everlasting life. 
My friends, I'm looking to heaven. I'm not looking to the place of judgment. Why? Because I receive Christ as my Savior. The Spirit of God is in me because no one is saved that the Spirit of God doesn't dwell in. The moment I got saved, God entered into me, and he is by his grace trying to direct my life and cause me to walk in the way that is right. I can choose, but why would I choose against the Holy Spirit who teaches me the word of God? Jesus could have said, I'll save man by sending the angels and just simply say they are whoever is on this earth is saved. He could have done that, but he couldn't do that if he was going to remain a just God. We live in a country where there's not a lot of justice. We live in a country where there's not a lot of justice. But with God, there's not any injustice. God said, I have to make men pay for their sins unless somebody pays for them in their place. Can you imagine that? God said, I'll send part of me. He is a trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We may not understand that perfectly, but God sent a part of himself to pay for my sins and for your sins and for all humankind's sins. And all they had to do is accept what Jesus did and they became a child of the king. They became saved by the blood of Christ, not by what they did or did not do. They were saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So says the word of God. So he couldn't send his angels to do it. He would not have been just in doing that. We forget even though God is a God of love, he's a God of justice. In order to fulfill the justice of Almighty God, he had to send part of himself to become the sacrifice for the sins of mankind. How can I thank him? How can I give him the adoration that he deserves? And that is to receive him and then serve him with my whole heart. He had to understand what mankind went through. He had to suffer at all points, yet without sin, but he had to suffer at all points like mankind suffers. He had to know what you're going through experientially. And so he lived on this earth for 33 years. He saw his stepfather die. He saw the grief that it came that came upon his mother Mary. He saw what mankind were doing to each other as there were crosses lining the streets of Jerusalem and Rome of people who did not submit to Rome. So he knew the horror of the cross. But that was God's way to show his horror of man's sin. I do not take sin lightly. If I find myself in sin, I ask God, forgive me and set me straight. We are sinners, but we're saved by grace if we've sa received Christ as our Savior. We do not stop sinning. We just don't choose to sin. And when we do sin, we have an advocate, a lawyer with the Father, says the word of God, Jesus Christ, pleading our case. And what does he say to the Father? I paid for that sin on the cross of Calvary. Yes, he was thinking of you on that cross. He was thinking of me on that cross. It was not a time when God forgot about us. He stayed there even though he could have called 10,000 or more angels to deliver him. But then we would not 
have had the privilege to go to heaven one day. This is not all there is to life. As I get older, I know that life is short. I was talking with a lady that was nearly 100 years old some time ago, and she said, it seems like it just went by so quickly. Well, the Word of God says life is a vapor. As you get older, time seems to go faster. I can't keep up with the calendar. I, I'm turning it all the time. I'm making monthly bulletins all the time. And I said, I, didn't I just do that? Time is going by. The week goes by so quickly. Yes, we think we have a lot of time. The Bible says it's time to seek the Lord. It's time to seek the Lord. The new covenant. What is a covenant? Let's get that on the screen. Number one. It is an agreement between two or more parties where each is required to fulfill certain terms. Let me say that again for those watching by way of the internet and public access TV. It is an agreement between two or more parties, people, where each is required to fulfill certain terms. That's a covenant. So the old covenant, they had to fulfill certain terms. God would do his part. Mankind had to do their part, and I've already told you they couldn't. In the new covenant, Jesus is doing both parts. He's doing both parts. The only way the new covenant could be inaugurated is if Jesus made it a surety, which means he made sure that it couldn't be violated because man had nothing to do with it. All that mankind could do is receive it as a gift of grace. There are all kinds of covenants, my friends, as the marriage covenant, and so many people break that marriage covenant. They don't recognize they have said when they said, I do, they've made a certain agreement with the partner that they would fulfill, and often they don't fulfill it. They don't fulfill it. When I made my agreement with my wife in marriage, I meant to fulfill it, and by the grace of God, I've tried to do that all my life. But it was an agreement between her, God in the middle, and me. God was the referee. You need a referee in your marriages. Without God being a referee, all you do is fight. God takes away that situation. When God makes the decision, when you quickly don't get into going to sleep before you deal with the problem, you go to prayer. God, either you do that singly or you do it together, but God will mellow you up. God makes a difference. I decided early in my marriage that when I had a disagreement with my wife, it hurt me more than it hurt her, so I was not going to continue in that disagreement. You see, what God is saying, if you have a disagreement with me, come to me and I'll settle it for you. If you have a disagreement in, in marriage, Come to me, and I will deal with that disagreement. Then there are legal contractions or contracts. These are covenants of business. And if somebody doesn't keep their part of that business covenant, then things don't work out. When you have a mortgage, you make certain agreements. If you don't pay your mortgage, then that is not ratified. It, it, it stopped. 
and you lose perhaps your property. There are peace agreements. We make peace agreements, and if individuals don't keep their part, or if we don't keep our part, the covenant is not sure, not at all. So there's all kinds of covenants in this world, but the most important covenant is between you and Jesus Christ. When you receive Christ as your Savior, you have made a covenant for life to serve him, to let him give you guidance and give you direction, to follow him with all of your heart. You made an agreement, save me and I'm yours. Too many people have not let him take over. The first covenant that was made, you know, if you read the word of God, was with Adam. God made a covenant with him, and he broke it when he fell into temptation through Satan. And he worked through the emotions of his wife, Eve. And then he worked through the one wanting to be one with each other. Through that, he gave Adam the break so neither one of them kept the covenant that God had made with them he would walk with them in the cool of the evening in the garden and I believe that it was many many times that he did that but he didn't fulfill it Adam didn't fulfill it and I say Adam because he was the head of the the couple and he was the one that was responsible, and thus sin was passed on through him. And look what happened. Chaos. Then there was a covenant that was made with Noah. Noah, I'm never going to flood the earth again. I'll give you the rainbow. It was a covenant in which God gave a surety to. But what did Noah do? The moment he came out of the ark, almost the moment, he got into trouble. He got into trouble, and I'm not going into what he got into. You can read that. But the point is, he didn't keep his part of the bargain. But God did. God did. None of us, number two on the screen, none of us is able to keep covenant with God, no matter how good our intentions are. None of us can do that. So I get up here and get ready to preach, and I say to the Lord down there in that chair, and I do it every time, Father, I want to preach your word. I want your word to be what people hear. Anoint me. Now, the moment I get up, God keeps his part of that agreement. I'll anoint you. And he anoints, but it's all God because I can't do it in my own strength. When you are leaning on God for all you need, you make it. When you're not, you fail. So God says, lean on me heavily. I remember Billy Graham, the great evangelist, saying once, if God took his anointing away from me, I wouldn't be worth listening to. Everyone that knew him knew that he was the humblest man they ever saw, and so was his team humble. That's why God used him in a great way. And that's why God wants you and I to rely upon him, to trust in him. He's knocking at your life's door, and he's saying, don't depend on yourself to live a godly life. Depend on me. Always depend on God to give you the strength to live as God would have you live. He tells us to seek him with all of our heart. Do we? We're covenant breakers when we do not. How did he go about making that better covenant that's talked about in Hebrews 7, 22 and Hebrews 8, 1 and 6? Let's note number three on the board, on the screen. He did it by making a covenant not with man, 
get this clear, but with a man, Jesus. He didn't make it with humanity because humanity couldn't keep it. He made it with the, the God-man, Jesus Christ. That's the only way he could save our wretched souls. That's the only way he could make us whole. And that's the only way he could save us. The only way it was made between God the Father and God the Son. Because it never could work when it was made between God and mankind. Because mankind never kept it. Never kept it and could not. Christ was the man God chose to make the covenant with. I will save the people if you will do what I have directed you to do. And Jesus said, not my will but thine be done in the garden when he didn't want to. He did not want to experience that cross in his humanity, but in his divinity he knew he can't possibly save our souls without doing it. And so... He was led as a slaughter to a shearing platform where they crucified him. When Jesus took our place, let it let you think about this. It was more than just being on a cross. How many sins have you committed yourself? Don't think of it for condemnation. Just think of it for a moment. How many sins in your life have you committed? They were all placed on Jesus Christ on that cross. How many sins were there in the whole world that mankind from Adam to the end of creation, the end of mankind being born, were placed on Jesus no wonder the father said, I've got to turn away from my son. I love him, but I can't visualize this anymore. God is too holy to look upon sin. And Jesus became sin because my sins, your sins, the world's sins were placed on him on that cross. And he stayed there until he said, it is finished. Which meant he paid for them all. That's why mankind will never pay for their sins. Remember, no one goes to hell because of their sins. They go to hell for rejecting the only one that paid for them, the Son of God. We will not have him to be our Savior. Sins don't take you to hell. Rejection of the one who paid for them takes you to hell. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but through me. So all the gods mankind has created will not take them to heaven. It'll take them to hell according to the word of God. And the word of God is true. The word of God is true. So it's important for us to understand that principle. When Jesus took our place, he was condemned by the Father on that cross as the worst sinner that could ever exist. And mankind was given entrance before the throne of grace to receive what Jesus did. That's why the, the, the curtain in the temple was torn aside because now you could go into the presence of God Almighty and he would listen to your prayer for salvation. He would save you by your prayer of salvation. What did mankind do when that temple curtain was torn in two? From top to bottom, they mended it. 
and they would not come the way of the cross. They would not receive the message of God Almighty that this is the way, walk ye in it. This is the way to salvation, and there is no other. Jesus did it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but my Jesus, my Jesus washed it away. Number four, yet he also took our place in another respect as one who walked perfectly in covenant with God. as one who walked perfectly in covenant with God, in agreement with God. If you will come to me, I will in no wise cast you out. If you will come to me, I will give you the salvation which is eternal, and no man can take it away from you, and neither can you. My friends, once you are saved, the Bible says, they're without God ever changing his mind. The gifts and callings of God are without God ever changing his mind, repenting. So I can't lose my salvation. I can be spanked by Almighty God to get me straight again. I can be directed by the Holy Spirit so I know how to live, but I can't lose what God gave me because he says, I don't change my mind. Once I save you, you're saved. I only say that make sure you have truly received Christ as your Savior. But if you have done that, you will never perish. You have eternal life. Jesus lived as a man, and he was sinless as an individual. He said to the crowds, who of you can tell me one sin I've committed? I'm not stupid. I wouldn't ask that. Jesus never sinned, so he could ask that. He was the only perfect man, and that's why he became the perfect sacrifice. He became the Lamb of God, which took away the sin of mankind. He was spotless. He was a keeper of the holy commands of God. Number five, yet there was even greater news. Jesus hasn't kept the benefits of the covenant to himself. He hasn't said, because I kept it, I receive it, and I'm going to keep it to myself. Rather, he shared it with us all. I am, and every believer is. That means a person that received Christ as a Savior I am a co-inheritor with Jesus. Everything that God gives, the Father gives to Jesus, he gives to me as well. I receive the same benefits that Jesus received for fulfilling the ways of God and the mind of God and the plan of God. You know what mystifies me and mystifies most people is this. God knew what he was going to do before he created mankind. He knew that mankind would be created because God knows everything, and mankind would fall into sin, and he'd have to eventually send his son to die on the cross if he was going to save any of mankind. And God still created. How can he do that? Because God wanted somebody he could love unconditionally. And so he created a man with the ability to receive that love. You know what God's going to say to you if you're a believer in Jesus Christ? Not you're a bad boy, you're a bad girl, but welcome, welcome, thou good and faithful servant. I saw your heart. I saw your desire to live for me. And although you fail at times, you are an individual of my own heart. Did he not say that of David when David sinned with Bathsheba? We're going to get the sure blessings of David? 
God paid for that sin. He had to, David had to pay for it losing his child, but he didn't have to lose his eternal rewards. I'm going to meet David when I get up there because God saved his wretched soul like he saved my wretched soul. But I won't meet some people because they have never accepted Christ as their Savior. They chose not to, and thus there is no other way to salvation, no other way. The Word of God goes on to make it clear to us that some Christians are overwhelmed at the thought of keeping God's commands. Well, simply let God do it through you. Simply let God keep his commands through you. When you came to Christ, the revelation of God's new covenant set off a light of understanding in you that now you could come into the presence of God boldly. To do what? To obtain mercy and grace to help you in your time of need. I need him every hour. I need him every moment. And God said, I'll give you all you need. If you need something, ask of me, the giving God, and I will give you everything that you need to live a godly life. Don't listen to Satan that says you have gone too far in the wrong direction. Therefore, don't come to me anymore. You're lost. That is not what God says in his word. The word of God makes it very clear that his nature is a nature of love. And when he saved my soul, he gave me his new nature. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. I've got the old nature fighting with the new nature, but I'm still able through the grace of God and the mercy of God and the power of God to choose to live in the new nature and put down the old nature. Yes, the old nature is there and there's a fight going on constantly, but you can win that fight. It was evident on the Mount of Transfiguration Perhaps you remember that's where three of the disciples went up and they saw Jesus transfigured and he began to glow. And there were two figures with him, Moses and Elijah. They died a long time ago. And people would say they must be dead. They, that can't be so. The guy has hallucinations. No, he actually talked with Moses and Elijah, Jesus did, and that's because they're not dead. They're with God in heaven. That's the clearest evidence, friends, that there's a hereafter. In every single person that has died in the faith, they have received Christ as their Savior during their life, and they have died there with the Lord. I'm going to see my mother. I'm going to see my father. I hope to see my brother and sister. I really believe that because they made a profession of faith on this earth, I'm going to see him again. So a funeral for a loved one that you know you're going to see again is a lot more comfortable than the kinds of funerals I've had, very sparse, but funerals I have had where the person never acknowledged Jesus Christ that I know of in their lifetime. And so I could not, I could not say they were in heaven. But all those that have are clearly in the presence of Almighty God. The word of God goes on to make it clear that the glory of that immense and beautiful situation where the disciples saw Jesus talking with people that had died years before changed their life. In fact, they wanted to, they wanted to actually build a booth 
three booths. They wanted to have a place they could go to worship, and Jesus said, don't do that. What did the Father say in the instance where they wanted to build that booth? Are those three booths? He said, listen to my son. Basically, what he was saying before that is, shut up. Listen to my son. You're thinking of what you're going to do so that you can come to this place and uh, you can worship this place where you found God. And uh, a lot of people are very good at producing things they can worship instead of worshiping Jesus alone. So the word of God makes it clear then that God gave such a vision it changed the life of the disciples. Note number seven, if you will. Number, all right, we'll go to number six. His nature began to be transformed into your nature is six. Then seven comes. Then God removed Moses, which represented the law, and Elijah, which represented the prophets, the law and the prophets. Okay, Old Testament from Peter's vision saying, my son embodies all the law and the prophets, the whole covenant, all that mankind will ever need. My son is what you got to look at now. My son, instead of think back to the Old Testament with the law and the prophets, point your heart and mind toward my son. You have one command now, Peter. That is to focus on Christ. Don't focus on anything but Jesus Christ. He's the fulfillment of all things. Don't focus on following a set of laws. Now, there's nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. Understand that, but it's not the way to heaven. God would expect us to try to live by the Ten Commandments, but not as a way to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven. When you love as Jesus loves, when you live like Jesus lived, then you begin to see that people see Jesus in you instead of seeing Jesus. The flesh. Number eight. As God looks on us today, he doesn't see people breaking his covenant continually. Why doesn't he see that? Because we're not the ones that are to keep it. God keeps it and transmits it to us. So he sees us through Christ as having kept the covenant Number nine, instead he sees us, in us the marks of his son and therefore looks on us as covenant keepers. Through Christ, he looks at me as someone that has fulfilled the law, has fulfilled his plan for my life through Christ, but only through Christ. Lest any man should boast. Paul made it clear. If it was any other reason through works, then we could boast. But it's not in the area of how many works we've done or whatever else we seem to have as marks of God. It is through Christ doing it for us. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. All forgiveness is ours through Christ. All peace is ours through Christ, a peace that passes all understanding. All acceptance by God is ours through Christ, and all grace abounds toward us through Christ. Do you see what I'm saying? Everything is because of Jesus Christ. All through Christ. Now Christ needs no assistance to keep us saved. He's done it all. And he knows how to bring up his children. 
He knows how to correct his children. God does it all in love and grace and mercy. His loving kindness draws us to him because he loves us with an everlasting love. But if I don't receive it, note what takes place. This is what Hebrews means when it says we trample the blood of Christ when we try to add something to God's peace or God's grace. I'm not saved plus getting baptized, although we should be baptized if we're saved. That's simply a statement that I died to the flesh. I was buried to my old ways, and I rose up again serving God. It's an indication of what happened at salvation, but the thief on the cross never was baptized, and Jesus said today, I will see you in paradise. But when I don't receive these things and I add to what God said, then I have trampled what Jesus Christ has done under my feet. And I've said the blood didn't do it all. One day I believe with all my heart we're going to see that blood on the mercy seat of heaven and that blood will indicate to us we're there by the grace of God through the blood sacrifice of the Son. Yes, we will know something of this earth because we will know how much grace God has given to us and how much he loves us. Now I close with these four. I haven't got a lot to say about these four, but they're essential for grace to happen in every believer's heart. It's number 10. First, grace is unassisted. Grace is unassisted. We cannot assist the work of God's grace without diluting and diminishing it. I can't add to what God has already done. And when I do, I get into trouble. Second, grace is unmerited. That simply means I don't deserve it. I've heard people say to me, I just don't deserve the grace of God. No, I say you don't. I don't. Grace is without you deserving it. And there's not a soul on this earth that deserves God's grace not giving me or giving me the opportunity to be saved or his mercy not giving me what I deserve. Number three, third, grace is unchanging. It's never going to change. Never. You can't run out of something God is. God is love. You can't run out of that. God is grace. You can't run out of that. God is mercy. You can't run out of that. I could go on and on and on. I can't exhaust God, and I'm so glad I can't. Finally, fourth, grace is unending. Grace is unending. When I get to heaven, I'll still be ex experiencing the grace of God. Grace, grace, grace. Nobody, and I'm putting this in a paraphrase, but nobody can imagine the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Do you love God? I love him with all my heart. And I know, if not everyone here or everyone watching me on the Internet or public access loves God with all their heart, I challenge them if they don't get to know the God that loves you and you'll love him with all of your heart.